I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. If you're 25 years or older, approximately, you probably remember what you were doing 15 years ago on September 11th or 9-11, 2001. You probably remember the very time when you first heard the news about a plane had crashed into the World Trade Tower in New York City. And for the rest of that day, we were absorbed in that terrible, terrible disaster, one of the biggest disasters in our nation's history. Of course, there have been many disasters down through history, not just in America, all over the world. Hurricanes, and earthquakes, and droughts, tsunamis, floods. Do you know that in 1931, the Huanghe River in China killed approximately 3,700,000 people? We call these natural disasters. Insurance companies call them acts of God. To these, we can add a variety of other personal disasters of all kinds. Why do these happen? How does an omnipotent, benevolent God relate to these disasters? How are we to relate to them? What lessons can we learn from disasters like 9-11? I believe our text will help us. I'd like to read for you the first nine verses of Luke 13. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were offenders? They were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. I'd like to share with you some lessons from disasters using this text to help us. The first lesson is that each disaster is a result of sin. But don't make the mistake that the Jews in this text were making. We're not sure who these some were. It says there were some present when Jesus was teaching and ministering to this large crowd of people. We know they were residents of Judah. That's about all we know. They were present at this very time. That is the time of chapter 12, and Jesus was teaching these various things that we find in chapter 12. Well, these people came to Jesus, and they made reference to an event of recent occurrence why did they pose this situation to Jesus? It could be they were really after Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. They hoped he could be embarrassed in some way. Perhaps they were after the Galileans because the people in the south part of Palestine, the Jew, in Judah, they didn't particularly get along well with those northern brothers up in the Galilee area. They were very evil wicked people as far as the southern Jews were concerned. 
Also, you had a rivalry between Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judah, and King Herod, who was over the Galilean district. And they didn't always get along well. So maybe they were just trying to stir things up here a little bit. This may not well be a time when they were trying to trick Jesus in some way, as they often did. Well, what was the disaster? It's described for us there in that verse 1. It was really a horrible bloodbath. Apparently, some Galileans were in Jerusalem and had gone to the temple... And somewhere along the line, they had disobeyed a particular law or laws of the Romans. And this gave Pilate, who was a rather vindictive, cruel sort anyway, an opportunity to send his soldiers into the temple area, murder the worshipers in their act of offering their sacrifices, take their blood, take that blood and have the soldiers mingle it with the sacrifices. Now, for the Romans to even be in the temple area was an abomination to the Jews, but to think that they even murdered those who were there worshiping their God. A terrible disaster as far as the Jews were concerned at that event. So how does Jesus respond? In verse 2, he does answer them. And he responds with a question because he was aware that behind this news in the minds of a lot of those people in the crowds was this idea. Those Galileans who were killed in the temple, they must have been very wicked indeed. Otherwise, God would not have allowed them to be killed in such a horrible, horrible way. You wonder what they did. What terrible disobedience of the law of God did they perform? It had to be horrible. This idea of sin and a very quick, immediate punishment was nothing new. In John chapter 9, the disciples were with Jesus, and they saw a blind man sitting at the side, and they said, Master, who, who sinned that caused this? Was it this guy's sin, or did his parents do something to sin against God? You see what they're doing. Pagan thought was full of such thinking. And even today, when disaster strikes, what's one of the first things people think of? What did I do to deserve that? What did they do to deserve that? Did those 3,000 people who, were, who perished in those Twin Towers and another place in the Pentagon and so on in Pennsylvania, that morning had they committed some horrible act against the Lord? Why did they deserve that? That's behind what these people are after when they bring that news to Jesus of that disaster. That's why Jesus in verse 2 says, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Is that what your point is? How does he respond then? No. In the Greek text, that's a very emphatic no. No. No, I tell you. A clear, unmistakable, emphatic negative. You are completely wrong in drawing that conclusion. These Galileans were not worse sinners than all the other sinners, the Galileans who were spared. The fact that someone comes to a sudden, violent end is not proof that they were peculiarly wicked. Now, having said that, Jesus himself calls attention to another disaster. It happened with the Tower of Siloam. The Tower of Siloam was in the southeast portion of the city of Jerusalem, probably some sort of a defensive out lookout of some sort where soldiers could get up there and keep an eye on the city, look and see who might be coming in, that sort of thing. And one day, suddenly, this thing collapsed and crushed and killed 18 innocent people beneath that terrible accident, that terrible disaster. Was it due to structural failure? Probably so. I remember seeing a cartoon years ago of a couple of contractors standing beside the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which at that time was standing straight. And one said to the other, I kind of fudged a little bit on some of the foundation, but no one will ever know. <clears throat> well, maybe that's what happened here. Somebody fudged on the building that, that tower. And on that particular day, 
not only leaned a little bit, it came crashing down and killed 18 people. Imagine the grief of the families of those people. What a disaster hit them on that particular day. So how does Jesus, having called attention to that disaster, how does he respond in verse 5? The same way he did in verse 3. No, I tell you. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others that lived in Jerusalem that day? And that's why the tower fell on them? No. That's not the reason. So we must not make the mistake of the Jews in this text. When I say that a lesson we can learn from disasters is that they are results of sin, is, is sin in general, not specific sins. We must appreciate the reality of the fall as described in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam, representing the human race, disobeyed God and he fell and with him all of his posterity descending him from him by ordinary generation. That's why Jesus uses the word sinners and offenders here. He knew that they were aware of what sin was, what offending God meant in general because of their laws, their basic background with the Old Testament. When that happened in Genesis 3, something of staggering significance happened to the human race. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 12. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. For all are considered sinners in the sight of God. They're born with that sinful nature. And then later in Romans chapter 8, it indicates that the whole creation was affected by it. And that's why we have earthquakes and we have terrible winds and we have droughts and that sort of thing. Nature itself, the creation of God, has been affected by what happened in Genesis 3. And that's why nice boys become killers and why beautiful oceans spawn hurricanes. In our, uh, I'm, I'm a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I meant to say this, by the way, earlier. Let me say it now. That the founding of our little denomination, we're a very conservative, Bible-centered denomination called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We have a church here in, called Trinity. We have the same historical background as the conservative Baptists. Uh, both of us came out of mainline churches that were becoming very liberal and denying the Bible as the word of God and denying Christ as the only way of salvation and so forth. So we hold much in common, even though we have our distinctives there. Well, in the Presbyterian tradition, we have the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. And the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 19, asks, what is the misery of the state into which man fell? In other words, when Adam fell, what miseries resulted? Here's the answer. All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. So when we look at disasters like 9-11, we have to face the fact we live in a sinful world. We live in a world under the divine curse of Almighty God. And as human history plays itself out, we see time and time again humanity rebelling against the Lord and against his laws. A second lesson we can learn about disasters. Each disaster is a warning of judgment. Go back to verse 3, at the end of verse 3. Unless you repent you will all likewise perish. Look at the end of verse 5. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus is emphasizing that. He repeats it. What does it mean to repent? It's actually a very simple idea that involves a major change of direction, a new insight into one's soul. 
a different understanding, different emotions. We, we speak of conversion, people being converted. If I were to ask you, some of you, when were you converted? Maybe some of you might say, well, I, I don't remember exactly when. I was brought up in a Christian home, and my parents taught me to know the Lord at a very early age. That's wonderful. That's, that's my testimony. But maybe some of you can say, well, I remember when I was converted. You can give me the month, the date, and the situation. And what happened then? You say, well, my life changed around. I was heading this direction. I went in a different direction. That's what it means to repent. You turn from your sinful ways and begin to trust the Lord and to obey him. We don't do it perfectly, but we are at least going in that right direction. But in our sophisticated, self-reliant, free-thinking age, repentance is a very difficult concept to accept, let alone implement. If there's anything a sinner in our day and age does not want to do, it's that. To turn from their sinful way. Why should I turn from that which gives me pleasure? Why should I turn away from that which is part of my whole reason for existence? I love to do that. Now, I don't want any pastor or church or Christian to tell me I should change my ways. I don't want to change my ways. But Jesus says, unless you do it, you're going to be facing a similar perishing situation as those Worshippers in, in the temple, the Galileans, and those people upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell. Now, I think he's not just talking about disasters like that, but certainly, ultimately, of divine judgment, and particularly of eternal judgment. The word perish, of course, appears in the most familiar of Bible verses. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Perish is in, it relates to eternal life, eternal perishing, eternal life. Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, a final judgment is coming. There's a moral order in our world. We're not just the result of an evolutionary process that just kind of happened from a big bang kind of thing, and here we are, we're just a bunch of chemicals floating around. There's a moral aspect to our universe in which God created. Now, Jesus was not saying that his listeners were as bad as the Galileans and the victims of the Tower of Siloam, but he left them to infer that. But as he did so, he warned his generation that they were heading toward the same kind of disaster. Go back up to the 12th chapter, verses 54 through 56. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. So it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? I am the Son of God. I am with you. I've been ministering now for three years, and yet you still do not hear my words. You still do not accept what I say. And so you better get your act together. Otherwise, destruction is coming to you. And then look at those last three verses in chapter 12, beginning at verse 57. And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. You're aware that you need to get right with the judicial system and do that which is the best thing to do to keep yourself out of prison. You don't want to go to prison. Well, you're very concerned about that. What about the final judgment that God is going to bring upon this generation? It's interesting that Jesus always took advantage of various situations to warn the wicked to, and to plead with men to change their evil ways. 
to consider their simple predicament and to come to him, the Savior, the Lord. And that's what he's doing here. So these incidents that we're looking at here in chapter 13 with the Galileans and the Tower of Siloam were warning models of the destruction that would come if they continue to rebel against the Lord. Indeed, the carnage of verses 1 and 4 would prove to be only preludes to what would happen in 70 AD, about 40 years later, when the Romans would indeed destroy Jerusalem. So the shocking disasters that mar our present age should remind us that all mankind is moving inevitably toward the disaster of disasters. And that's described for us in 2 Peter chapter 3, where he begins that chapter saying, you know, there are some people that uh, don't believe, they, they, during the time of Noah, they didn't think there was going to be any flood. And lo and behold, that disaster struck them. And there are some people saying today, where's the promise of his coming? You talk about Jesus, he's going to come back again. Well, where is he? We haven't seen him yet. In chapter 3, verse 10 of 2 Peter, Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Don't you think it's time you need to change your way of living so you'll be ready for that time? Disasters are very terrible things when they occur, and it seems like every week there's a new disaster someplace. Most recently, the flooding down in Louisiana, Mississippi, the results of the hurricane going up the East Coast, and on and on it goes. But you see, it wouldn't be good if they never occurred. So in a sense, we ought to be thankful for disasters. Why? Because otherwise, we would become very, very complacent. All is well between us and our Creator. But then these disasters come along and cause us to think, hey, wait a minute, maybe things aren't all that well. Maybe the Lord is trying to get our attention. God is love, but remember his love is holy love and it's just love. So lesson number two is, in addition to the fact that disaster is a result of sin, there are warnings of coming judgment. One more lesson I'd like to share with you this morning. Number three, disasters are extensions of mercy. Yes, each disaster is evidence that God is a merciful God showing compassion to those of us who are in misery. Now, how can that be? Because each disaster reminds us that he's still holding back his full judgment. That, which I read in 2 Peter, has not yet come. The final judgment is not yet upon us. We know not when that will be. And so we still have opportunities to escape ultimate judgment, even though we don't deserve it. And so shattered cities and scattered debris and burned bodies and de devastated forests and ruined lies, these are going to continue but don't you see, that means there's still time to respond to the gospel. There's still time to hear about Jesus and his love for sinners. There's still time to examine one's own heart and say, I'm not right with God. There's still time to understand the love of God in Christ, to put your faith in him. So in that sense, it's extension of God's mercy. I read for you a moment ago the parable of the fig tree that Jesus told in verses 6 through 9. A fig tree matured in about three years. If it was fruitless during that time, it just didn't produce any figs, it would be cut down. So in the story, there's a particular fig tree, and the owner shows up 
looks at it and says, well, this hasn't done anything for three years. Cut it down. Let's get rid of it. And the vine dresser who works for him says, no, 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 no. Master, please, one more year. One more year. I'll, I'll take good care of it. I'll do everything necessary to help it grow. And if it does, well and good. But if it doesn't, well, then you can cut it down. So what, what was that little story all about? Well, the way I understand it, the owner represents God, the fig tree, the Jewish nation. The directive of the owner is to cut it down, his desire for fruitful living, the barrenness of the tree, the wickedness of the people, the vine dresser, Jesus and his messengers, leaving it alone, Divine mercy providing opportunities to respond and to repent. Failure to bring forth fruit, ultimate judgment. Notice the magnanimous, generous delay. The owner was under no obligation to do that one more year. He'd been rather patient for three years. But he graciously, mercifully says, all right, one more year. When Jesus was in his ministry of three years, national Israel already had the opportunity to hear his teaching, to hear him speak, to see him, to respond to him or not respond to him. They were witnesses of his crucifixion. At that point, the Lord could have said, enough is enough. But the Lord graciously added on, as it were, another year, actually another 40 years. If you think Jesus' crucifixion was around 30 A.D., more or less. And the Romans' soldiers came in from the north in 70 A.D. And they came in, and they leveled that city to the ground. They leveled the temple to the ground, and then told the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Jewish people were terribly slaughtered. It was a horrible, horrible disaster of disasters for them because she had not turned to the Lord in faith. History demonstrates what happens to spiritually barren nations, even Israel. And yes, even a nation like America. After 9-11, we noticed, we remember there were lots of people who went to church and prayed and we got together and sang God bless America and all these wonderful things happening. But pretty soon some questions were being raised. How could God let this happen? Where was he? To which someone answered, well, don't you remember you asked him to leave? You had asked him to leave the schools. You had asked him to leave politics. You had asked him to leave your lives. Interesting response. Billy Graham has said, if God doesn't judge America, then the Lord will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, a beautiful, fragrant flower bouquet lasts only for a time. Probably you ladies can remember either your husband or boyfriend or whoever it was brought you a beautiful flower bouquet. Or maybe for a birthday you were given this beautiful bouquet. And you put it in a vase and watered it, kept your eye on it. It was so beautiful, it smelled so nice. And then after about a week, you looked at it, it was beginning to go. You said, oh, no, no, no. You do all you can to keep that thing alive. But eventually, it's cut down, as it were, and thrown away. Lesson number three. God has extended his mercy to our generation. 9-11 was a way for the Lord to get attention of America. America, you have been forsaking me. It's time to get right with me. And signs of God's mercy are all around. Churches meeting for worship. Christian ministries of all sorts. Bible preaching. Books and tracts. Personal witnessing. 
all around us, especially in America, is the Christian influence. And even though it's being attacked, and even though we are struggling with all kinds of challenges, there's still tremendous things going on in the name of Christ. And First Baptist Church is one of those places where that's being done. God is extending his mercy through you to others. You see, our days are not merely wonderful moments of time for us to exploit for our own personal pleasure. How many people feel that way? I ran across this interesting quotation by J.B. Phillips. We want not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. A senile benevolence who, as they say, likes to see people enjoying themselves and whose plan for the universe is simply that it might be truly said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. A lot of people in our country are kind of roaming through life like that. Much of our society looks at disasters this way. The world rolls on forever like a mill. It grinds out death and life and good and ill. It has no purpose, heart, or mind, or will. It's the way it is. These things happen. Just live with it. Endure it. They don't realize that our days are gifts of the mercy of God. Opportunities to seek the Lord, to find him, to serve him. No doubt about it, 9-11 was a terrible disaster, not to mention all the other disasters that have occurred in world history. But these are times not just for shock and grief and tears, they're times also for pondering and thinking about the meaning of these world-shaking events. The question is not, why are there so many disasters? The really question is, why aren't there more of these disasters? From the judgment of a wrathful God, the fact that he's holding back these disasters as he is, is evidence again of his mercy to us. What we should be asking is, what lessons are, they, are there in these disasters for me? Am I right with God? Have I repented of my sins? Is my trust in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation? Am I resting in him? Am I ready to meet him? These are some of the lessons we should be learning disasters as they occur. Let me close with these words from Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon.